So you made it uh, through the first day of the container day here in Hamburg. And um, I'm going to fill the last slot today with a, yeah, I would say slightly lighter topic. So it's uh, probably not something you want to try um, in your kind of business environment. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, why is it or it isn't a good idea to run uh, Kubelet on a vacuum or use Kubernetes to control your vacuums. Um, so maybe a bit about me. So my name is Christian Simon. Um, so I'm yeah from the south of Germany, roughly, as you might can tell from my accent. And I at some point started Kubelego. Maybe you know that. So don't use it anymore. Cert Manager is now the new thing. And I'm using vacuum cleaners for more than 25 years, I would say. So, and I actually found some uh, evidence. <laughs> so that's me with my first vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Um, so basically, um, I'm going to speak a bit about the hardware capabilities. So I have two of the vacuums with me. So, so the, the vendor is Xiaomi, if I pronounce it correctly. Um, and yeah, basically they are quite cheap. Um, they're having a newer generation now of hardware. Um, so I think for yeah, around um, 200 US dollars, you get one of those. Um, later then, I'm looking at the software stack as they are like delivered to you, and um, I'm talking about how to replace parts of that stack with um, your own code, which then uses some Kubernetes technology parts, copy pasted boilerplate to actually make them work. Um, then a short demo, and if there's enough time, I have a couple of more ideas where future work could be um, done around that. Um, so basically, um, that all is based on um, someone else's work. So on the 34C3, um, there were some guys rooting that device. So there's a Ubuntu Linux on it. Um, they found a way modifying images to get SSH keys onto it so you can actually SSH into it. And also some people analyze the protocol they speak. So nothing I've done around that. So it was all just um, yeah using what is out there and was quite good documented uh, in all of those cases. Um, so the whole thing, I spoke about um, that topic before at KubeCon, and so, yeah, I'm not too sure. I wanted to order one of these vacuums, but I didn't have one in my hands yet, and I just uh, submitted a, a talk um, to KubeCon, and then it was accepted, and I, oh, shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do all that work now. Um, so, yeah, I came up with a couple of ideas. So. Um, I thought like, yeah, maybe if I get three of them, I can build like an HA control plane. So, um, yeah, but uh, I thought like that's not good enough to fill like the 35 minutes and a lot of people build HA Kubernetes components. And I think the hardest thing would be to compile it for the architecture maybe, or not even that. Um, then I thought about, yeah, maybe um, I actually want to run containers on them. So they have some ARM board, um, I think with 512 megabytes of RAM. Um, but I thought, yeah, it's quite hard. So um, 512 megabytes are not that much. <laughs> so you d definitely don't want to run anything substantial there. And yeah, so I, I didn't go down that route. Um, I thought about like maybe some crash battles with vacuums. Um, yeah, that's definitely interesting to do. But yeah, it doesn't really provide any value. And I would need a lot of vacuums. And so um, the other idea, um, and that is basically on the back of the talks at the 34C3, um, was, yeah, I want to control my own vacuum. It shouldn't connect to some vendor's cloud. And yeah, I want to schedule cleanings and all maybe monitor them with Prometheus. And so um, basically, um, that's then the route I went with. So um, yeah, as I said, it's uh, quite cheap. So. At KubeCon, I think it was still $250. That's a bit cheaper now. Um, there's a version 1 and version 2 of the hardware. So this is a version 1.1. One one. Um, it's a bit ch yeah, cheaper, as I said. Um, and in March, they actually um, reached feature parity in terms of software. So version 2 had a bit um, more advanced controls um, to send uh, the vacuum to a position to, um, I think, yeah, limit the kind of cleaning areas. And that basically made it into the older version. And the main problem, I would say, is the Wi-Fi chip, especially if you want to give a talk about it. Um, 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi on conferences is often a bit flaky. 
And um, yeah, that was actually a problem at KubeCon <laughs> where the demos didn't really work. Um, and um, yeah, so it comes with a battery. Um, if you don't uh, run the vacuum, so like the only power the, the system um, on a chip, um, you get like two days from the battery, which is quite good. <laughs> Um, and you can extend it with a uh, USB port on the bottom of the um, of the robot. Um, so yeah, there are a couple of CPUs in it um, that do the, the the kind of processing of the sensor data. Um, yeah, I, I don't know too many details about them, um, but um, basically you have quite a, a lot of sensors um, as you can see here. So I think the main thing is the the lidar laser distance sensor, which basically tells them what the, the kind of high-level walls um, um, and how the room looks like. And he also uses that like to, to find its way around. Um, then you have some clip sensor. So um, the vacuum, um, uh, when it would drive on its own, it wouldn't like drive up, uh, drive down this, this clip here. But um, so we figured out uh, in Copenhagen at KubeCon that you can actually drive them backwards and it will drive down stairs and <laughs> anywhere you want. And there's also some bump sensor. So um, first of all, there's uh, the, the kind of detection with the um, microwave sensor in the front. So it will go shorter when it hits some some um, obstruction that isn't seen by the, the LiDAR. And then when it actually bumps into something, then this will finally make it stop. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, I think the, the other ones like uh, accelerometer gyroscope. Um, yeah, so um, it basically uh, notices when there's a drop or when there, there's some other kind of thing that um, um, makes the wheels uh, come out. Um, and basically now uh, I would like to take a look at the software stack. So um, it has like a bootloader U-Boot uh, open source. Boots a 3.4 kernel, which is yeah a quite old kernel version. And um, uh, it runs an Android... Uh, kernel for whatever reason, so um, luckily the kernel was available, so I, I was able to build some some kernel modules to play with it to understand it a bit better. And then they just boot a pretty plain Ubuntu 14.04, so um, it boots into a read-write partition. You can apt get install things <laughs> if you really want a Wim or a Tmux uh, running there. That's that's all possible. And then for uh, the kind of um, communication, it uses the player open source project. So it provides like an API um, for uh, for sensors that powers robots. So um, I think the player API provides like um, yeah, compiled modules that register in. And I wasn't able to look into those because the source wasn't available. Um, but like in general, I got out like a lot of information from the player API. Um, and then there's some more proprietary software on, touch that, uh, on top that communicates with the cloud, manages the, the robot itself, and does the actual driving. So if we look a bit of at the software stack, that looks a bit like that. So um, you have the player daemon, like somewhere here, and then the, the actual robot controller that schedules cleanings, and yeah, makes sure it stores the position where the dock is and things like that. And then um, some Wi-Fi controller is attached. And then this Mayo client is the actual one that communicates with the outside world. So there are a couple of protocols that are used, mainly um, some, some, some kind of UDP, or if UDP doesn't work, it falls back to TCP. And it also uploads um, larger items like maps it drove um, throughout a cleaning to a S3 bucket. Um, and the whole thing is yeah, located uh, in the so-called Mi Cloud, or and uh, that's the vendor's kind of product that connects all its uh, smart um, devices together. Um, so basically, like the workflow flow would be something like your smartphone connects to the Mi Cloud, and then it either sends uh, the commands um, through the cloud to the Mayo client, which is like having some pull loop from the cloud. Or if it realizes I'm in the same Wi-Fi, the IP addresses or the IP ranges matches, then it sends it directly um, to the Maya client. I think that's some some uh, DNS um, discovery. 
<coughs> so in terms of protocols on that kind of TCP UDP side, there's some Xiaomi robot protocols, so it's all JSON based, uh, mainly request response. And to yeah, make it a bit more secure, they wrap some AES encryption around it. And um, yeah, I think, yeah, I'm not too sure every, um, every robot comes with a different key, and that's also the kind of authentication to, towards the, the, the cloud. So they have some database with these, those keys and then match them up. Um, yeah, it, it's the, the same protocol on UDP and TCP. As I said, and it just falls back to TCP. Um, and then basically, the next step for me was like, how can I get or fit something that I trust a bit more because I wrote it? <laughs> Um, into that um, whole software stack. Um, there are also some, um, uh, in the talk of the 34C3, there were some questionable debugging um, possibilities, so like a TCP dump of all your Wi-Fi <laughs> that you can then upload to S3. And uh, yeah, it's just, uh, I think it uploads like 100 megabytes a, a day, like without any special, um, yeah, so if it, if even, even if it's not cleaning it, it's just a lot of logs and kernel and that get uploaded, uploaded. And yeah, potentially as it's not like under any kind of legislation, um, yeah, where, where data protection laws are enforceable. Um, yeah, so you have no way of getting rid of the data collection there and potentially can't delete it in the future. And so um, basically, yeah, I asked myself, how can Kubernetes help me to solve that problem? Um, and so basically, um, Kubernetes is a pretty good reference implementation uh, of a distributed system. Um, and yeah, they, they focus on making those codes reusable. So um, for example, you, you have like the, the code generators for Golang, you ha have the API server project separately that you can then just uh, reuse and yeah, maybe use a similar architecture in the way you structure your services. And um, that helps, for example, with monitoring. Um, so the Prometheus full model works for a lot of use cases. Um, kubectl is a quite nice command line tool to, to investigate things. And also the, the Kubernetes API with RBAC and authentication provides a yeah, nice way of yeah, making some robots accessible to some people and others not, or various commands of the, them um, accessible to um, yeah, selected subjects <laughs> in that. And so how would that look like? So um, basically, my Kubernetes API server is where the cloud was before. Um, I'm connecting with kubectl to, to the API server. And then on every robot, I'm replacing the Mayo client with a thing I called Rocklet. So um, I think the root password or some password to encrypt the image is uh, rock robo. <laughs> so like it was not too hard to find out <laughs> um, how to build or um, encrypt your own image. Uh, so I called it rocklet. Um, and basically through that, um, the, the rocklet can then, yeah, act like a fake kubelet. So it pretends to the API server, I'm an actual node. It also makes sure that it taints itself I'm not an actual node, I'm uh, more of a vacuum robot, and so, so don't um, schedule pods to me that um, are not really meant <laughs> to be running there. And um, with that kind of model, I was able to use um, the higher level objects, so you know, like pods are like the smallest or simplest resource that is used a lot in Kubernetes. But um, on top of the, the pods, you can have jobs, which then can have cron jobs on top of it. And that was actually quite close to the kind of, um, yeah, I want to um, run a cleaning of the living room every Monday kind of problem that you have with vacuum. And also, um, at a node, there, there's a nice kind of way of reporting conditions in the API. I think I've not actually done that <laughs> other than the default conditions, but that would be a nice way of saying, oh, my battery is quite empty or the, the dustbin is full, so please <laughs> clear that up, that would be a nice way to, to report that back. So um, how does that look like for, for commands? So I'm just um, abused a bit the pods back here. So every rocklet watches, um, as every kubelet watches, um, the API server for new pods created. 
and uh, instead of um, expecting a Docker image, I'm just expecting a command in the image section, section of the YAML spec. And then the arguments are just passed um, as a JSON. So all, all, of the, um, all of the commands have like a, a JSON argument in the um, Xiaomi um, protocol I mentioned. And so, so that is basically um, uh, instruction to send the robot to an X and Y target on the map. Um, and you can yeah, run, basically, um, schedule a pod, and then the pod, as soon as the robot executed the command on it, will um, go to state to succeed it. Um, if something goes wrong, it will be failed. So um, I actually I'm actually going to schedule the cleaning now for in five minutes' time to <laughs> tell me that it's time for the demo. Um, so basically, where is the window? So here, um, that sounds maybe familiar. I'm not too sure if you can read that. So who basically, if people use the cron job object, that should sound quite familiar. Um, I think the time zone, or it's UTC time that runs in my mini cube, um, so I have to schedule it for um, 40 minutes past three, and basically um, I'm going to run it on Rock Robo Brandon, which is this one here, and I'm going to tolerate that this is run on a vacuum. As I said, I'm protecting it with taints, and basically I just wanted to start the cleaning. So that is um, what I'm now going to send to my API server. So the cron job has now been created, and hopefully we're we going to hear <laughs> the vacuum start in four minutes' time or whenever um, that happens. Um, I also implemented a little kubectl exec command to be able to remote control it. So um, yeah, basically it launches a process on the vacuum where you can use the arrow keys to control it and yeah, manually drive it around. So we can have a play afterwards or <laughs> during the demo. Um, so um, yeah, basically it's it's just like um, on on a normal kubelet, it will attach your standard in, standard out to the Docker or whatever your container runtime standard in, standard out of the process has, and I'm just abusing a few parts of the code of the kubelet there to, to run an actual binary on the node. Um, how did I implement the kind of state reporting? So uh, the node object is fine for attracting like this pods to the, to the vacuums and, and reusing parts of Kubernetes, but I actually want to see what the vacuum is doing a bit more specifically. And so I um, obviously came up with the idea of using CRDs for that. So CRDs is a way to extend Kubernetes with your own objects. So I created a vacuum CRD, and the vacuum CRD stores like the status of it. Um, it also contains like the actual map and some part that it's driven on the map. And in the future, it might be possible to use like the spec to say like this is the, uh, the audio volume or this is the fan speed of the cleaning that you want to have. It's not implemented currently, but here we can have a look how that might look like. So um, that's yeah, just the YAML files you um, know from, from Kubernetes a lot. And so like the charger is at X, Y position. Um, it's cleaning for four minutes and 53 seconds and like fan power is whatever, or this is the kind of area we cleaned so far. Um, I also um, wanted to have like a record of every cleaning. So every um, vacuum stores like an SQLite database of the jobs it's run. Or uh, so I haven't found like a time limit, so mine still stores all the cleanings it ever had. Um, and it stores like the, the kind of map. It has um, the completed status or an error code. Um, and it also stores the area cleaned. Um, yeah, the, the map there um, basically is, is in some custom format. And I somehow needed to find a way um, to get it into a PNG so that I'm able um, to display it in the browser later. Um, we're going to see that shortly, I think. Um, because I am created a little web UI for the whole thing. Um, I always wanted to use Elm for um, reporting Kubernetes status back. Um, and yeah, this was a good chance to spend some time on it. 
Um, basically, what happens, I have a go backend that wait, watches the API server. And once the API server receives an update to one of the CRDs, it sends the notification to the front end. The front end then reads it back from the API server and basically rereads the CRDs. And that, for example, um, whatever, posi whatever, whatever position change you have on the status object, um, you're going to see that update pretty much immediately. And I think that's quite useful for a bit more real world cases um, where you want to see pods appearing and disappearing. And um, yeah, we're going to see that, I think. And yeah, now it's uh, <laughs> 5.40 and obviously it started. Um, so that's the, um, the UI. <laughs> As it looked like at KubeCon, so at KubeCon we had three robots um, and they are called like the founders of Kubernetes. But we raffled one out, so only um, Craig and Brandon are left. <laughs> um, so we can now. I'm not too sure if it's destroying anything here. But we can now take a look um, how that looks like. So this is the the kind of UI as it is right now. Um, you can see the status update. It's cleaning, and <laughs> not really. <laughs> um, and so, for example, it's driving or it's uh, going a bit mad now, so I click pause and it pauses actually. What happens in the background when I click pause? A pod is going to be created. <laughs> it's going to get scheduled to the, <laughs> to the robot and makes it stop. So it's actually quite immediately, so I was quite surprised when the first time I had the UI working. Um, so we can take a look if you don't believe me. So. Um, so that is like the view here. We can see that's get vacuums with a couple of extra fields. Um, that's get nodes. So the two vacuums are ready. They run whatever version of the rocklet. And that are all the cleanings. And now if i going to have a try and do some kubectl, uh, get pods. So we see 46 seconds ago, um, I clicked pause. And yeah, this succeeded. And if we look into the pod itself, um, Rocklet UI, BMB. Um, yeah, we see a lot of like defaulting happening, but we also see image pause here where the cursor is, and that basically causes it to stop. And obviously now we can zoom in into the map a bit, so that is the part it's driven. And I, I can actually send it somewhere. I'm not too sure which direction that is now. <laughs> so, it's so it seems to be going that way. And we see it actually driving on the map. So that's every time you see a change here, it's the CRD getting updated, Elm getting triggered to reprint the SVG, which draws this like, and the PNG is also going to get updated like no, when it changes in the CRD. Um, yeah, so we can try to drive it off the cliff. It shouldn't. <laughs> and yeah, in the meantime, we can try to get the other one. Uh, yeah, I th I'm quite confident it doesn't commit suicide here. But uh <laughs> um, and if we look at the other one now, um, so we have added a little. Camera. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this one here, and it should also start driving. And yeah, I need a bit of a split screen. <laughs> so um, because um, it starts always with like an um, empty map, and now you can see um, this other robot building up the map wherever it is right now. Um, so I let's just drive it out a bit. Yeah, so this one is complaining that the filter needs to be replaced. <laughs> <laughs> ah! <laughs> <laughs> and basically here you can, can see like the walls of the tent. I wasn't too sure before trying it how good that will work. And well, my feeling is that it should be drawing there now. <laughs> mm. 
no, it's probably not the tent. It's more like the kind of audio or sound equipment that is there. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, we can try to make it drive back and show me on the camera. Yeah, so the, the kind of positioning takes always a bit longer. Uh, that was not good. Sh more shows the audience. <laughs> um, and, and basically, like, um, I found some limits today wi while trying that. So the, the CRD gets really large, and the updates take long, and the Wi-Fi, and whatever it was. But um, at some point, the positioning stopped updating. So you have to think of this path as like a long list of X and Y <laughs> colons and YAML. So the object gets large um, quite soon. Um, and yeah, maybe one last try that it's actually going to show me on the camera. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, as you can see, it's a lot of fun to play around with it. <laughs> um, at KubeCon, yeah, we had uh, a lot of fun in the Airbnb <laughs> making them crash. and <laughs> So it wasn't really um, that productive to uh, implement new features. Um, OK, um, yeah, where is my slides? So basically, like, that's what we just saw, like the, um, the web UI, as I said, based on PNGs from the CRD drives the path, uh, um, uh, draws the path onto it using SVGs. And yeah, it really works nice. Um, I think the hardest problem was the, the kind of coordinate system. So the PNG has a different one than the vacuum except positions in. And there's a third one. I forgot <laughs> um, what that was. But um, just to make everything match was quite tricky. Um, I implemented some Prometheus metrics, so I'm not running any Prometheus on my Minikube, but in theory, you can read out whatever, how many cleanings you have and how much time was spent on it. So like, it's quite easy to yeah, build something on top of it now. Um, so basically, that was the demo that started a bit er earlier than thought. Um, yeah, I think I had a few ideas what the kind of future work would look like. Um, so basically, the the, the current connection scheme in Kubernetes, so every time you run kubectl exec, logs, or there's another one. Yeah, I'm not too sure now, but port forward is the third one. Um, the API server actually opens an SS, uh, an WebSocket connection um, to your node. And obviously, if you want to do that for the consumer market, it's a bit tricky because <laughs> the WebSocket needs to, um, or you, the API server needs to connect back into your nodes, your vacuums. So I solved that by running the API server here in the same network, and I just can reach the vacuum. So I think that would be something um, where it has to be a bit a different model of communication. Um, I think using a custom API server would be a better <laughs> shout than just abusing um, get nodes or the nodes object and the cron jobs. And, and basically, this would allow us to use like native um, cron jobs or vacuum jobs and vacuum cron jobs and clear that up a bit better. Also, there's a lot of boilerplate you have to do in uh, Elm to get your JSON decoded reliably with nullable values. And so that was a quite manual thing. Every time I changed the um, spec of the CRD, I had to yeah, propagate that down to Elm. And yeah, I think some, some generation there would be, uh, code generation would be really, really handy. Um, yeah, um, uh, I think uh, actually people are using, because the Kubernetes API publishes uh, open API slash swagger JSON, and then you can actually build some code on top of that. Haven't done that. Um, so the my first approach didn't really work and was a bit of a time sink, so I didn't go down further there. Um, yeah, as I said, like monitor more things in Prometheus. I think the vacuum tells you how long the brushes will last and 10 other things. So it just needs to be implemented, um, just MVP thing. And then an uh, interesting thing would be to use a controller to actually do some operations based on the position of the vacuum. So you could draw things or <laughs> yeah, that was another idea <laughs> I had. And yeah, basically that was it pretty much. So mm, the code I have is like on GitHub, zero documentation. <laughs> 
So I struggled as well to make it running again after one month. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you ha have any questions about parts of it. So basically what I want to do is using the Elm UI to connect natively without any Kubernetes involved, because then the work wouldn't have been too much <laughs> wasted <laughs> on that UI side. Uh, and then you can run it without Kubernetes on the vacuums or on some where in your home network, and you don't need to connect to um, to the Windows cloud. And yeah, that was it. Um, not too sure. Maybe I'll have some time for questions, but yeah. Okay, no questions. Then yeah, enjoy the all attendee party and yeah maybe see you one of the next talks or tomorrow